Welcome. Welcome to the National Security College at the Australian National University. My name is Rory Medcalf. I'm the head of the National Security College. And it's a real pleasure to welcome our viewers and listeners from all over Australia and indeed the world to this new series of events for the National Security College, a series of conversations about national security in this age of disruption. This is the first of a series to mark the 10th anniversary of the establishment of the National Security College. And we have a very special guest today uh, who I'm going to welcome in just a moment, uh, Duncan Lewis who is, I guess uh, you would say in Australian parlance, a national security legend, but we'll come to that a little bit uh, later on. Firstly, I want to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land uh, where we're meeting today. Of course, here in Canberra, it uh, is the land of the, the Ngunnawal people, and I acknowledge and celebrate their elders past, present and emerging. So. In today's event, in, in this evening's discussion, what I'd like to do, Duncan, is range um, fairly widely across the, the national security challenges of this time, if you like. Uh, I want to talk uh, with you uh, a little about the establishment of the National Security College, because in your career you've played uh, a key role in that, among many other things. And also I want to, I guess, uh, delve into your career somewhat to get some advice for future national security leaders. But before I do that, Duncan, in welcoming you to this, uh, this special event for the National Security College, I guess I'd note to our viewers and listeners uh, a few of the high points of your career. Of course, uh, you are now a retired leader, if you like, of uh, the national security community here in Australia. Uh, most recently, of course, as Director General of ASIO, of the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation, for five years, from 2014 until, until last year. But of course, before then, uh, in no particular order, uh, a, a very distinguished military career in the, uh, the Australian Army, uh, reaching the rank of Major General, Commander of Special Operations. Of course, you were the first national security advisor uh, that this country's had appointed by Prime Minister Kevin Rudd. Uh, you were also Secretary of Defence and Australian Ambassador to NATO, and I'm sure I've missed a few things along the way. But this is not an episode of This Is Your Life. Uh, I really just frame those, uh, those career highlights to again say that you've been uh, a very particular leader in the Australian national security community. And so I really can't think of a better person to open this series of national security conversations for the college. Now, of course, the National Security College, as you know, and some of our listeners and viewers know, is a very unusual institution in this country. It's, it's a joint initiative of the Commonwealth Government and the Australian National University. We focus very much on the training and education and development of new generations of leaders in the Australian policy and practitioner community. Uh, and we really try to have, I guess, the academic rigour of a university, uh, the agility of a think tank and the access to understanding what matters to government that the national security bureaucracy has. Um, I'll leave it to you and others to judge how we're going on that journey uh, 10 years on. Now, they say that in national security, those who know don't speak and those who speak perhaps don't always know. And I know there are many things you've learned in your career, Duncan, that you probably can't talk about tonight, but I wanna move a little bit beyond uh, that dichotomy, if you like, and begin by asking you a few, um, a, a few questions really about why is it, how is it that Australia began to form a more integrated national security community and what was the role of the National Security College? What was the origin story of the National Security College in that? Rory, thanks very much. Thank you for your welcome and uh, welcome to uh, all of those that are listening this evening. Um, uh, when you started reading out my CV there, I have been accused of actually not being able to hold down a job over the years. <laughs> as you can see I've had so many. Um, but it's a great honour to be here um, and I'm particularly pleased to be able to um, join you for this conversation to mark the 10th anniversary of the formation of the National Security College. Uh, this place has a particularly soft spot in my heart. Um, I was centrally engaged in the establishment of the college uh, 10 years ago and uh, it uh, is quite an interesting story actually. The development of a national security community as such is a direct result of 
the complexity of the world. I mean, Australia for a hundred years ran a defence policy, it ran a foreign policy, it ran to an extent a domestic security policy. But these things were run, if you like, in stovepipes and in isolation. Uh, we were not um, engaged uh, in our own right as a, as a, a you know, country internationally. There was a lot of, we were a, a party to coalitions. We were a minor party in some major alliances. My sense is that by the mid nineties, um, it was becoming evident that there was this emerging need for a more sophisticated and coordinated approach to national security. And we used to draw that, you remember that Venn diagram, the three circles, defence policy, foreign policy mm. and domestic security mm. policy. And you could draw a circle around the outside of all of that mm. uh, and say, well, that is national security. And where the pig's ears, if you like, of the Venn diagram mm. occur, then that was national security policy. Mm. And um, when Prime Minister Kevin Rudd came to office uh, in 07, it was part of the then government's platform to create a national security advisor, to appoint a national security advisor. And uh, a year or so later, I was very lucky to be appointed as the first incumbent of that, of that position. Um, and so if you can imagine at that time, we were heading towards Timor. Timor, of course, was a, a uh, an opportunity really for the whole of the national security apparatus in Australia to start thinking of ourselves in, in a national sense, that we had to play the full game. We had to play all positions on the field, not just a half forward line. Um, and so the story about the formation of the college is a, a quite a folksy one actually. Um, we were, uh, the Prime Minister, Kevin Rudd, myself and uh, Air, uh, Air Chief Marshal Angus Houston um, were on the flight deck of a C-130 flying into Kandahar uh, to visit the Special Forces Task Force that was, uh, was in there. In, it was in late 2009 and uh, uh, the Prime Minister asked me about the national security community and I said, well, one of the gaps, if you like, in our game was that we didn't appear to have a mechanism for preparing mm. young men and women to start staffing up some of these national security um, institutions and requirements. And uh, he said, well, what do you think should happen? And I said, well, I think we do need um, an academic footprint somewhere. Mm. There needs to be a college. There needs to be somewhere that's got a plaque at the front saying National Security College. And uh, he was at the time quite keen on establishing the China Centre here at the mm. university. So in a discussion I had with him, I said, okay, well, look, why don't we do this together? We'll mm. run them together. And I think in the end, uh, you know, I said to him, we'll need money for this. And we managed to pull, I think it was something like $37 million from government in order to establish a combination of the China Centre and the National Security College. And uh, so that's essentially the genesis of it. The Prime Minister threw his weight behind it. Equally importantly, he put some money behind it. Um, there was a lengthy and very satisfactory uh, engagement with the uh, negotiation with the university. Vice Chancellor Ian Chubb and I had some long discussions about this because the Commonwealth was very adamant on mm. getting value for money um, and still is. Yeah. Um, but I think I the- know. I know. <laughs> I know but every day. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the relationship between the university and the Commonwealth yeah. was in some ways reignited for some of the original purpose that ANU was established. Yeah. I mean, it was established yeah. way back when as an institution to support the development of a federal public service. Yeah. And so it was in many respects reaching this kind of original intent. So I think, no, I think that, that that's really key, both the point about the complexity of national security that maybe drove the, mm. the need uh, that, you know, I'm very pleased you pushed along mm. for the National Security College, but also that idea of the university being part of that national interest effort, if mm. you like, because that's the, certainly in the founding vision of ANU in, in, in the 1940s. But moving, I guess, to the present day, uh, and of course at the National Security College now, 10 years on, we've trained or worked on the professional development of, of literally thousands mm. of Australian government officials, security practitioners, uh, and indeed moving beyond 
the traditional security footprint. Your Venn diagram of three, I'd argue now, is of course a Venn diagram of four or five economic policy, technology policy. There's so many areas now mm. that are touching on national security. And I'm going to use that as a kind of a pivot to move to the challenges that lie on the horizon. Mm. Because uh, I think if you look at this landscape of risk over the next decade, I think Prime Minister Morrison recently spoke about the 1930s. Uh, mm. One way or another, that's, that's a really uh, intriguing analogy. But there's certainly, with, with, with the COVID pandemic, with the bushfires mm. we've had in Australia, with so many other issues, great power relations, a lot of people are really worried about what the next decade's going to look like. Mm. I'd love to hear some thoughts from you on how you characterise uh, mm. the risk landscape looking ahead. Yeah, sure. Um, I, the word uncertain, of course, is just right in front of your, mm. uh, of your consciousness. We in the national security community have been saying for maybe a decade now mm. that the world was increasingly uncertain, unpredictable. There were more variables um, afoot than there had been mm. during times of the Cold War or even immediately the aftermath of the Cold War. Um, so uncertainty has been a mantra of the national mm. security community as it looked at the global environment and the global risks that were presenting. What's happened in the last sort of eight or nine months in this country, mm. of course, is that a whole bunch of other social and environmental um, factors have come to bring that uncertainty into the homes of almost every Australian, mm. or maybe every Australian. Mm. Uh, you mentioned the agony of the bushfires. Mm. Um, now the uncertainty and the anxiety that's being created around the COVID um, uh, pandemic. So uh, we have really complexity and uncertainty in this rather volatile mix. Mm. And so when I've been asked recently about what is my assessment about that, I say that things are fairly grim. It is a pretty grim outlook at present. There's not a lot to smile about. But having said that, I want to make two points. Um, I do think that we are at a point where the global world order, the sort of Bretton Woods post-World War II mm. world order, is now not only under challenge, but it is going to change. I think there are going to be mm. changes and there are going to have to be changes to accommodate the reality of the shift in modern, uh, or the, the recent shift in the tectonic power plates of mm. the globe. I think that that needs to be reflected in, an, in a revised, mm. I won't say a, a completely revolutionised, but there will need to be accommodation made. Um, and so if, if you add that to the second point I want to make, which is while the outlook is grim, I do not in any way regard it as being inevitable that we're heading to some sort of major conflict mm. or some sort of major um, uh, military upheaval. Or um, I think there are many discontinuities that will occur before that. And I'm firmly of the view that it's within the wit of man to manage our way forward out of this without going into some of those horrific events of the last century. Mm. I mean, I think it's really important. You know, the Prime Minister mentioned recently this issue of the 1930s. Mm. Now, I was asked recently, you know, does history repeat itself? Mm. And we all know, well, it doesn't repeat, but it rhymes yeah. often. And I think there is some resonance in what we're seeing at present. I, I don't subscribe to the fact that we're replaying the 30s, or, but, but the resonance is mm. very, very clear to me. So um, I guess that's what I, I would encapsulate by saying there is uncertainty, there is complexity, the outlook is grim. It's been compounded now by uh, events both in this country, bushfires mm. and so forth, and globally. And when we talk COVID, of course, while that is a medical science tragedy, it is an economic catastrophe, and likely mm. to be. Mm. It is now, and mm. it, it will be. I mean, I see some of the figures starting to mm. come in from local Australian industries as we're into the reporting mm. season, and, and you can see profits are down in wide mm. swathes of the community. 
and that's going to be reflected globally. So I think the economic discontinuities that will come out of COVID will also feed into this issue of a rather grim outlook. But look, I am not glass half empty, if you mm. like, about mm. our ability to address these issues, but we will have to lift our game. Mm. And I want to come back to that yeah. later on. That's, yeah. that's absolutely key. Yeah. I mean, the, the question of whether Australia is a country that, uh, in fact, is, uh, is less than the sum of its parts mm. when we need to be more than the sum yeah. of its parts. But I want to, um, I guess, get more specific about this horizon of, of risk and challenge, if mm. you like, and even that question about the, the, power, uh, the power shifts. Because, of course, there's a tension there. On the one hand, mm. uh, you know, it's nice to hear an assessment, and I, I don't disagree with that, an assessment that, 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 that cataclysmic conflict is mm. not inevitable. Mm. But at the same time, it's very hard to change an order without the shock mm. of, of some kind of disruption that could go really bad. Mm. So um, let's talk a little bit more particularly about the rise of China in the region and the world, the, the dysfunction uh, that we've seen in the United States uh, at, at present, certainly. Um, questions about other countries in this region. I, I'm, I'm a, a big advocate of the idea that it's a multipolar region, mm. even if the US and China are, are significantly stronger by, by, by so many measures. Uh, it would be interesting to hear from you in a bit more detail how you see some of the plausible futures for Australia in, in that environment. Mm. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, in 2013 I travelled the Atlantic seaboard of Europe uh, as the newly appointed ambassador to mm. Brussels and I could scarcely excite any interest in conversation about China. Uh, that would be speaking to the most um, important and most mm. significant uh, European powers. Wow. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that last year I did a similar trip in um, a different role mm. and that's all that people want to talk about because the world has changed mm. in those years. It's changed dramatically. Um, China is a very complex phenomenon. Um, there is uh, absolutely nothing wrong with uh, an emerging power such as China pursuing its interests. All countries pursue their interests. Mm. The difference here, of course, is that we have a major world power um, which is being shoehorned, if you like, into um, a space in the world. Mm. And China sees that space as being rather larger, and I don't mean in geographic terms, but just as, as a, an mm. influence. Uh, and there are others in the world who are occupying parts of that space who mm. would prefer that the boundaries remain where they mm. are. Mm. That's at core what is at stake here. And the issue is how does the world um, adjust and accommodate, uh, and I don't mean acquiesce, mm. I mean accommodate yeah. the reality of China. Um, and in this country, of course, we have the great challenge of having China, as we all know, as our major trading partner, and it's mm. been in that category mm. for many years now, um, and us having a very deep and positive relationship with the People's Republic of China, both in the past and we must into the future. I think that's absolutely critical. So how do we manage this? I think there's an emerging consensus among those countries who watch China and are both pleased and concerned with China's rise to say, well, we may have to act in unison around this. And this is not containment. I'm not suggesting mm. that for a moment. but where there is common interest among countries that are engaging with the People's Republic of China, mm. then those countries should act in harmony and in unison and make sure that their position is heard and understood. That's enormously important for Australia. You know that as a middle power, we are highly dependent mm. on there being um, uh, rules, um, that there are mm. international laws and there are rules of behaviour. Um, it's absolutely in our interest to ensure those rules are followed. Where they're not followed, we need to be able to call them out. And where we are able 
to ensure that they are re-established mm. or reinstituted. Um, you mentioned a moment ago about we need to come to the point of, well, what do we do mm. about, about this? It's very clear to me in my few years involved in diplomacy uh, that it's through that vector that much of the heavy lifting needs to be done. And uh, again, my opinion, mm. my personal view is that while our diplomats in this country have over many years done a wonderful mm. job, uh, and I have worked with the young men and women that have been delivering diplomatic outcomes mm. and foreign policy outcomes for this country, and uh, I am not critical in any way of their exertions or their intellect or indeed their achievements. Mm. But we will nationally have to expand our capacity in that area. Um, as I say, it's not a criticism, it's mm. an observation that nationally, both the government and the wider community is going to have to lift its um, diplomatic effort. And, that, and that's at a time where I think many of us have noticed uh, yeah. that the resourcing yeah. of our diplomacy is under really under, under great strain. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Because the risks of diplomatic failure and international misunderstanding are disastrous. Um, and the uh, potential benefits to be had by achieving that understanding and achieving the, the meaningful negotiation and, and establishment of, of um, acceptable outcomes is the acme of success, mm. particularly for a country the size of Australia. Um, I mean, we're not in a position to go around sort of throwing our weight around. It looks silly, it's inappropriate. Uh, we do have to maintain, of course, a very capable defence capability. And um, again, I applaud the actions of a succession of governments uh, to do that. Um, but I really do think that over the next couple of years, even in that area, we are going to have to sharpen our pencil. And so, I mean, I think, again, it's important, you know, for the record, because this is very much a conversation for the record, we, we, we've got mm. the, uh, you know, a, a very significant security leader here emphasising uh, the importance of resourcing diplomacy. I think that's something mm. that we'll take away from that. I want to keep on the China and the regional power play thing for a moment longer and then mm. move on to a few other uh, issues, all of which are related in the end. Um, but one specific issue on how Australia copes with Chinese power and influence has of course been the whole debate about foreign interference and influence. Mm. And of course it was during your time as Director General of ASIO that this issue really hit the headlines yeah. in Australia. And we saw, I think, a really concerted effort by government, including through legislation, uh, to address it. I, there are some misperceptions, I think, out there, or many perceptions out there as to what is really going on, what has really mm. happened in that space. And one, of course, is the, the suggestion that this is simply Australia doing what America wants, mm. rather than, I guess, Australia uh, taking actions uh, in its own interests. How mm. did you see that debate evolve? And, and maybe you could just share a little mm. bit of light as to the logic of what Australian governments have mm. done in that space. Sure, Rory, this is a really important issue. Um, you mentioned at the start that in the national security space there are those who uh, know and can't speak and those who speak and don't know. And unfortunately, so here you go. <laughs> in, in this particular space, that observation of yours yeah. has a particular resonance. Yeah. Um, it's a difficult subject. It's a very difficult subject to broach with the broader community. Um, look, countries have been spying one on another forever. Um, some people have said it's the second oldest profession. Mm. It's been going on since, you know, man mm. first started interacting in some sort of intertribal relationship. Um, what has changed is technology now enables ideas, um, it enables material content to be moved around the globe in nanoseconds. Uh, it involves uh, putting all of your information into databases, which of course are potentially uh, vulnerable. Uh, we have had mass uh, movement of people over mm. the last 50 or 60 years, mm. uh, where you've got very large diasporas mm. in many countries, and of course our own is a glaring example mm. of this. Mm. And that is a most wonderful thing, because mm. these diasporas have contributed enormously to, to our uh, our country, both culturally, economically, and, and every other which way. Uh, about 27% of Australians, uh, when I last looked, were not born in Australia. Mm. 
that's hugely more than mm. in the United States, mm. for example, where I think 17% of their population is not born in the United yeah. States. So we have very large diasporas here. And as I say, that's overwhelmingly a thing for good. But of course, in a diaspora community, mm. uh, there are opportunities for any foreign intelligence agency to work. I mean, it's mm. self-evident. Mm. Um, you know, you, you would obviously try and use that mm. as a vector. Yeah. Um, you'd use your own diaspora in foreign places in order to, uh, to get um, access mm. into secrets. Uh, and it's really to do with this stealing of secrets that has come to a head as a result of the technology and as a result, of course, of those um, tectonic power shifts mm. that I spoke about earlier. Um, and so it became apparent to me, and certainly to my organisation um, four or five years ago, that we actually had an issue in this country. Mm. Um, now, everybody leapt, of course, onto China. This is a China problem. Mm. Well, of course, it involves a range of countries. Mm. It is not just China. There are all sorts of people trying to gain access mm. and, and, and have influence and we're still interference on, in, in our community. Now, I need to speak about the difference between influence and interference. That would be useful. Nations have tried to influence one another forever and that is perfectly within the rules. It's done commercially, it's done economically, it's done politically, it's done socially. Influence is, a, is above the line of visibility. Mm. People can see it. It is entirely acceptable to, uh, to pursue influence. But we insist on it being transparent. Mm. Where it's not transparent, it slips down into foreign interference. And this is a far more sinister yep. and serious matter. And it was foreign interference that was worrying me more than anything else. And it can be done through commercial vehicles, it can be done through political vehicles, social vehicles, all, all sorts of, of vectors by which you can bring foreign interference. And you basically saw all of those vectors during and your we time. And we I saw suspect. this happening. And your own sector, mm. the education sector, mm. is a classic example of this. Mm. Um, and so it fell to me um, um, and others uh, to bring this matter to the attention of government. Mm. And um, I must say that the response of the Australian government uh, has uh, been fantastic from my point of view. The passage of the EFI, the EFI, the Espionage and Foreign um, Interference Act uh, the passage of the um, uh, the foreign transparency, the FITS, as the mm. foreign yep. transparency um, uh, the register. scheme yep. register. Yep. Um, a whole range of other legislative measures that have been put in place, many of which were contested, of course, mm. um, have left me with a view that the Australian government has a very good bead on this problem. They understand, uh, the government understands, and equally importantly, we have together mm. managed to expand that understanding into the broader community. Yep. Now, it's not complete, mm. but I can tell you that the corporate Australia, the academic institutions, the senior academic institutions in Australia, the, uh, the senior cultural institutions in this country mm. are now all perfectly aware. State governments. Too. State governments, another big issue, state mm. governments, have an awareness which was not in existence five or six years ago. So I draw some comfort from mm. that. Now it's a journey mm. and it's going to continue to morph and we will a bit like a malarial prophylaxis. You've got to maintain, you've got to be on the, mm. on the strain as it mm. changes. Um, so I'm, I, I'm comfortable with that. One other observation, we in the Western democratic world, of course, have this paradox, if you like, between the obligation of the state to protect and the uh, rights of the individual to privacy. Mm -hmm. um, now, many people put these things in complete juxtaposition that they, you can't square the circle. Mm -hmm. I don't agree with that. I think you can. 
I think you can square the circle on this. How do you I, do it? I think <laughs> it's, I, well, I think it's by um, a, a transparent discussion with the community. I mean, I think there hmm. needs to be transparent discussion. And when you think about, you know, the last job that I had as a Director General of Security, head of ASIO, the presence that I had, my predecessor David Irvin had, Dennis Richardson before him. I mean, these we have increasingly become public figures, if you like, and Mike Burgess, the current Director General, is continuing that. Mm. We were in front of the Australian community in a way that our distant yeah. predecessors never were. It, it was a different yeah. world. And, uh, and so <coughs> I think this discussion, which is still not settled mm. um, between the obligation of the state to protect and the rights of the individual to their privacy, mm particularly around um, individuals' data. Mm. I, I think that is a, a discussion that is still underway. It hasn't landed yet, but it is able to be landed, mm. in my view. And it's a, it is a permanent tension. In fact, that's very much at Absolutely. the core of the discussions we have with our students and the college every day. So yes, we'll, yeah, um, yeah. we'll take it further. Yeah. But I would like to just quickly move to the broader horizon of risk because, uh, as you say, it's not only a case of not China is not the only mm. challenge, if you like, uh, in, in, in this regional and global context. Mm. There are so many complexities now that you've talked about, whether it's technology, whether it's the changing nature of society, information, environment. Mm. Um, if you were looking at this decade of the 2020s and perhaps beyond, mm. and if we're using analogies of, you know, the famous analogy of the, the black swan, and I know I think you're a, you're a West Australian <laughs> from way back, so you know, the black Can't swans are actually... Western Australia, but I am West Australian. We can go to that. Black <laughs> swans are, 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 are actually quite benign, but, but of course the black swan is a symbol now for, if you like, catastrophic problems or major discontinuities, not always bad, uh, mm. that weren't expected but in retrospect look glaringly obvious. Mm. We like to talk about black elephants at the mm. National Security College, which is a black swan crossed with the elephant in the room. In other words, it's mm. glaringly obvious. Uh, it's mm. so big that you don't do anything about it. And some would argue that COVID uh, for some countries fell into that category. Mm. So looking ahead for Australia, some black swans, some black elephants, what do you see as the big challenges? Well, I think COVID uh, is, a, is a, a black elephant and a black swan that's rampaged through, I think, all countries. I don't think mm. there's anybody on this globe that's going to be uh, able to stand aside mm. from the impact. Uh, and I think I intimated a little while ago, it's not the medical science. I mean, that's bad enough in itself mm. and tragic. Mm. But what does worry me is the economic um, aftermath of mm. this is quite likely to be a discontinuity which will bring enormous stress and strain on the international community. So that is an elephant that's already mm. been in the room, trampled around mm. and sort of broken down the door. Mm. So we can park that for the time being. I think the next great discontinuity uh, is going to be created with um, the management of artificial intelligence and where that takes us. It's been particularly impactful in my most mm. recent um, appointment as, as an intelligence agency head, uh, where artificial intelligence and the flow, the flow on from that, which really is machine learning and then deep learning, you mm. know, those two particular technologies, mm. are going to provide an enormous challenge. for. In fact, I watched something on the television only last night about the issue of deep learning and some of these, um, you know, weird video clips that are completely fictitious that mm. are enormously harmful at a time when we're on the edge of a US mm. election. Um, we have got state elections in this country in the coming months. Uh, we will, in due course, have another federal election. Um, I mean, really, the last federal election for the first time in my working life, mm. we had a discussion about, well, can yeah. this and will it be influenced um, yeah. in an improper way through the use of manipulation of data? Yeah, it's coming. Uh, it wasn't mm. to my satisfaction, mm. but nevertheless it was a concern, and I think that's going to be a continuing concern into the future. So I think this issue of, of information management and manipulation and big data, um, the fact that we will, as a species, have access to data uh, at levels that were unthinkable mm. in the past, and they've brought challenges to the way human beings relate to one another, Again, harking back to my ASIO um, experience, 
a human being now mm. that might be of intelligence uh, interest to any agency in the mm. world will inevitably have an electronic footprint. Mm. And that footprint is much larger than the physical specimen themselves. Mm. You know, the human being is only six feet tall. Uh, but the, the electronic footprint is indelible, mm. uh, it's global, it's instantaneous, uh, and it's pretty easily read. Mm. And so that is of great concern. I think there's going to be an issue about privacy and, uh, and the ability of the state to monitor. We're starting to see it in some of the, um, uh, the countries that are outside the democratic, um, what I'd describe as the democratic mm. sphere, mm. countries that are running um, a single, state, uh, single party states, uh, the monitoring of the population, uh, these are very worrying developments and they're going to challenge humankind mm -hmm. uh, as we go forward. So that's, that is what I yeah. think is probably the next, um, I'm not sure it's a black elephant or a black swan, but again, probably both. So connecting that with people, because mm -hmm. in, in the end, and, and as we've, we often teach at the National Security College, the future is as much about people as it's about technology. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I guess, do you, do you also see, how do you see a changing horizon of risk within society. I mean, mm. terrorism was one of the issues you obviously had to deal with uh, mm. throughout your career, terrorism, mm. extremism, you know, of all kinds. Mm. And I guess it often breeds in an atmosphere of, um, of disruption. So I'm just wondering if there are other issues mm. that you'd also care to comment on to mm. do with the, the changing nature of society. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, d could I just go back to terrorism? Yeah. It's a very yeah. uh, unfortunate conclusion that many come to that terrorism's mm. fixed. It's not. It's not fixed at all. Mm. Uh, we've seen the end of a phase, the military operations in the Middle East, uh, but the idea, mm. the idea that we were trying to defeat lives on. And so terrorism is here and it's here to stay for the foreseeable future. We will need to be very, very careful not to take our eye off the ball. Um, the Middle East is still um, a tinderbox um, and when you see events, and I'm not suggesting the Lebanon explosion the other day was, no. was a terrorist event at all, that's not my suggestion, but you can see how an event like that all of a sudden surfaces all of the tensions and the difficulties that exist um, you know, between the sects and between the, the various religious groups and, and so on. So mm. all of that's still alive. Um, to go to other threats, uh, your question, um, mm. I think climate needs to be very, very carefully watched. Um, I remember uh, Alan Dupont um, writing to me when I was the National Security Advisor in about 2009-10, mm. saying we needed to, to pay more attention to this. Um, now, of course, at the time, this was all fairly new. It was mm. very controversial as to whether the science was in or out. Um, we've moved on now, and I think uh, uh, the, the science is very clear. Um, and we are going to have to be very, very careful uh, the way we move forward with regard to the discontinuities that climate change will bring. In my line of business, it's not such a worry about climate change. That is for scientists and yeah. people involved in agriculture and all sorts of other things to worry about. My concern, my, my selfish concern mm -hmm. as, a, as a security practitioner, is what are the, what are the discontinuities that this climate mm -hmm. change brings? Is it going to mean there's huge population shifts, uh, you know, is it going to mean that large, densely populated areas are going to go underwater? Mm. Is it going to mean all of these things, yeah, which conflict will, which over will resources obvi or, obviously yeah. conflict over resources? So, so that, that is a concern to me. Um, I think another area which bears thinking about in the national security context is space. Um, it's a fast developing um, common mm. um, and Australia, which had a very early foundation mm. in that domain, mm. but I think, sadly, took its eyes, you know, we took yeah, our eyes much. off the ball for yeah. a number of decades. And it's only recently that I think governments um, have started to concentrate on this again. So I think that is an area where we'll need to pay a lot of attention. We do have something to contribute here. Mm. and. Um, we do have much to gain. So I think space is another area. So th there's a couple mm. of thoughts of things that 
uh, kind of on my mind of where we're going in the future. I think, uh, and uh, incidentally on space, I think you'd find that uh, it's you know, a furious agreement from mm. um, quite a few of us, including uh, my own vice chancellor. So, right. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. But look, let's um, let's move on to what to do. What are the, I wouldn't say what are the solutions because these mm. problems are never permanently solved. Mm. But in terms of managing the risks, building resilience, which is such a uh, I guess a, a buzzword these days. Yeah. Uh, at, People don't always know exactly what they mean, but it's certainly uh, the, the plan. Uh, but really, building resilience, fortifying uh, society, but not turning the nation into Sparta uh, along the way. What do you see as some of the ways forward for Australia? And that's really a way of getting into a conversation about what we in the national security business call the architecture. Mm. Uh, you know, the bureaucracy, uh, the agencies, the arrangements of government, the relationship between government, industry and society. Mm. Uh, how much of that have we got right? What does the journey look like? Uh, be interested to know mm. what next in that space mm. uh, to, to address these issues. It's a, it's a very... Um, complicated question. Um, I'll come to architecture in a, in a moment, but I think the journey that's been made by a couple of countries, you've got to be quite selective here, countries that have been presented by ex with existential threats from the point of their creation, if you like, mm. through until recent times. And, you know, you think about some of these countries that are very conscious of their own security um, because they have very little strategic depth. Uh, they consider themselves vulnerable and they are usually small. And they're not always democracies, which is an interesting challenge. they're not always democracies. Challenge. And so there's a couple of obvious examples mm. that we often talk about mm. here. I mean, the state of Israel has its particular challenges. Uh, the Republic of Singapore has its particular and different challenges. Mm. Um, the Republic of South Africa from time to time has been in, included mm. in, in that sort of mix. These countries uh, have done a journey and I think it behooves us to study that journey without turning into Sparta and this is the, this is <laughs> the know, important, yeah, I, I agree yeah. with that, I mean that is, that is yeah. un-Australian. Um, but the advent of terrorism since 9-11 created in this country a shock. Mm. We suddenly discovered that we had people in our community mm. who didn't like us, mm. who were unhappy with the way that Australia was governed and mm. run, and they in fact are enemies of the state, if mm. you like. People that went yeah, off there, to fight in the Middle thing. East. Yeah. This was a great shock to me. It was a great shock to, I think, most Australians to find that mm. we had kernels of these of, of, of this unhappiness mm. in our own community. So how do you get social cohesion? How do you get uh, a relatively um, uh, unified understanding of what the security posture of this country should be going forward? Mm. In a multicultural Federated democracy. Federated <laughs> democracy. And, yeah. you know, you see yeah. even now it's not in the same kind of league, but the stresses and strains that the COVID debates are mm. bringing among mm. the states and the federal government are being very well managed. I think mm. in, the, in the case of the federal government certainly is managing this, in my view, extraordinarily mm. well. Um, but you can see how, um, uh, how vulnerable we are. You, you know, mm. you don't need to scratch the surface much before the cracks start to appear. Um, in something as, mm. as profound as our federation. Mm. Um, so I think we do need to be careful about the future. We need to harden up uh, because the world is um, going to get pretty tough, I suspect, out there in the next mm. um, few years. It, it's sooner rather than later, I might add, too. That's the other thing that's yeah. changed. The horizons that we used to consider for, for much of my working life were well out there. Yeah. You know, they're in the decades. Yeah. If you have a look at defence procurement, yeah. it's always in the decades in advance. Well, all of a sudden, those horizons have come in to be very short range. And the new strategic update does say 10 years warning time, no more. No more. Yeah. So yeah. we need to recalibrate. That affects all yeah. sorts of things to do with defence procurement, to do with posture, to do with diplomacy, mm. to do with the rate of effort of Australia and the world, to do with how quickly we can assemble a coalition of like-minded folks mm. to sort of steer a path into the future where we are reasonably yeah. joined up. Um, 
And all of this is happening at a time when the United States is presenting uh, a most um, uh, unexpected and un unusual posture in its global yeah. stance. I mean, the last four, three or four years have been unusual. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. That's I a mean, polite we, way to put that's it. That's right. <laughs> I mean, we, we shouldn't beat around the bush yeah, with this. Yeah. And I am an enormous fan mm. of, of the alliance. I think the alliance is something from which we must not retreat or resile. In fact, it's a time like this that we should be leaning mm. forward into um, the alliance and supporting our major ally. But all of these things, when you start aggregating them, lead to this uncertainty that I spoke about mm. and to the rather grim, I use that word mm. very guardedly, mm. the rather grim outlook that exists. But grimness is not resignation on my part to defeat that we're all going to, you know, mm. we're all ruined, said Anne Rand. I mean, I, I, I'm not in yeah. that space at all. This is, this is recoverable, but we need to work very hard at it. Now, to come to the specific, I'm sorry I've, I've gone on a little there, no, but to come good. to the yeah. specific about the structures, mm. the structures are interesting. Um, I mentioned Timor. I know that from a defence perspective, Timor was the first time in sort of memory mm -hmm. that Australia incorporated, led um, some sort of military coalition, mm. uh, some sort of um, you know, military partnership, um, all of the, the coalition of the willing. We'd always been a bit player and we mm. have subsequently been a bit player in certain coalition activities. But that was a bit of a wake up. And I think it showed that we needed some structure I became convinced when, the, almost from the moment that I left the service, uh, when I retired from the Australian Army, and I joined the Prime Minister's department. That's 15 uh, years ago uh, now, right? 19, yeah. Uh, yeah. 2005, yeah. 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 Uh, it became apparent to me almost mm. immediately that the Minister for National Security is the Prime Minister. Mm. That's not written anywhere, but it should be mm. on the front of his door because the national security minister is the prime minister. Um, we have, as I mentioned before, that Venn diagram, the defense policy and foreign policy and now domestic security policy. That particular part of the circle, of course, mm. has been uh, drawn together significantly mm. with the creation of a home affairs department. Mm. So there's some tidying up, that's good. Um, but the prime minister still, in my view, as the National Security Minister, must have an apparatus of his or her own in order to manage that environment. And you can say, OK, well, there's a Prime Minister's Department and there is a, a well, it's more than a division, there's a, 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 an area, a group within the Prime Minister's Department which is um, uh, supporting him in that way. Um, and without any form of criticism of the current or past occupants, I mm. was one myself yeah. in that space, I think there is a requirement for um, a more visible national security coordinator to support the Prime Minister. Um, now, this has been argued uh, for many, many years. Um, as I say, I happen to have the privilege of being the mm. first national security advisor. We only had one successor and then the position was essentially done away with. Mm. I thought then it was wrong and I think today it's wrong. The way in which a national security advisor would be created now might differ from the mm. way we did it then. Um, when I was appointed, it was very important that I had an office within the Prime Minister's mm. department. And it was really driven by the fact that if you wanted to know where all the money was going in the national security community, you had to be part of that mm. kind of budgetary process and have a, have a window into the, into the respective budgets of various parts of the national security apparatus. Whether that still pertains or not, I don't know. It has been suggested, for example, the position could be a statutory authority, mm. which would be sitting outside of the Prime... Well, well, it would still be in the Prime Minister's portfolio, mm. of course, but would be sitting outside the department itself. Um, that's a discussion to be had. 
Um, Would that be more or less empowered in your view than the position that you held? Uh, probably differently empowered. Mm. I don't think it would be more or less. It mm. would be different. Um, I mean, one of the great challenges for any national security advisor is that you are faced with this enormous, um, uh, almost a daily um, effort to coordinate between very powerful and um, well-funded and mm. historically established organisations mm. and their leaders, you know, mm. chiefs of defence force, secretaries yeah. of departments, commissioners of police. You know, th these people are, are people of enormous substance. Mm. They are running very large organisations for mm. which they are accountable. Mm. Uh, they run very large budgets for which they are accountable. Mm. And so the acme of success, really, of a national security um, advisor mm. is to be able to um, coordinate. <laughs> and, and I don't mean that in the academic sense. No. It's, really, it's really like getting the team together mm. and getting a consensus and making sure that the, the team generally is moving forward. Now, you know, people have often said to me, well, it was a bit like herding frogs in a wheelbarrow, you know, and, and it is. It's, you, you get them all in the barrow and then you walk forward a couple of paces and two or three jump out. Yeah. Um, so you're constantly in that sort of herding um, uh, environment. Um, but these independent departments and agencies are quite rightly powerful, they're authorised and they must be. So that's the acme of success yeah. of a national security advisor. It's quite a peculiar, it, it's the most challenging thing I ever did. Uh, it was a, it was the greatest challenge of, of my working life was actually running that national security advisor's office and being the national mm. security advisor to the prime minister. But the benefit that you get from having a person a national security advisor travelling with a prime minister, being on mm. the kind of left shoulder of a prime minister to support that prime minister mm. in his or her duties as national security minister is critical. Otherwise, who's on the prime yeah. minister's side? I mean, I was the secretary of defence once upon a time. I wasn't on the prime minister's side then. I was on the defence minister yeah, and, and the defence department, and you know, I'm arguing my lane as I should. I mean, you have an understanding, obviously, of what the the PM and, and the government at large is trying to achieve, but but you're working your lane. So who's working the prime minister's lane? That's that's my point. So you've you've brought us very neatly, and I think with some um, some pointedness as well to, I guess, the final part of our conversation, which is really, and I'd really like to keep this going, Duncan, but I know mm. we've, we've promised an hour and we'll keep it to an hour, which is really about careers. Uh, and it's about, um, I guess, high points, low points, challenges, in particularly your advice for professionals in this space. Because, mm. you know, at the National Security College, I think one thing we've tried to do over the past 10 years, uh, in keeping, I think, partly with that mission that, uh, that you, uh, among others, really uh, entrusted to us, is to build uh, a culture, a national security culture that involves integrity, that involves leadership, that involves collaboration. Mm. And I think we've used this word a few times tonight, it's a journey. Yes. Um, but a lot of our students and the, the officials who've taken part in our courses, a few of them we, we crowdsourced for questions for you mm. tonight. And the questions we kept getting were questions like high points, low points, mm. uh, what's your advice, particularly for people at midpoints in their career who mm. may be encountering obstacles. I'm going to throw all of that at you as kind of a blamange of questions mm. and just uh, see if you can give us a few, mm. a few thoughts about career, mm. career advice. Yeah, Rory, I do have some develop views on this. <laughs> I mean, my view for any young officer who is starting out in the national security space is work hard and do your job. Read widely, um, but do your job. The midpoint in one's career is mm. a bit different. And I'm not suggesting you shouldn't be doing your job, mind you, in the mm. midpoint. But at the midpoint of one's career, it is necessary to start branching out from wherever it is that you have had your, your genesis mm. into other areas of national security. Uh, I, I tried as a national security advisor, and I was spectacularly unsuccessful with this, to mandate the progression of senior officers in the intelligence community mm. to shift from one agency to another. You had to have moved from one agency to another. 
I was inspired a little bit by the sort of Goldwater Nichols Act in the United States. I mean, the Americans had to actually legislate in the defence space to make sure that military officers mm. were moving from joint appointments back to their service and then to other joint appointments, mm. but getting a wider understanding of the US military. They had to legislate that. Well, I tried just to have it as a practice within the intelligence community, and it was unsuccessful. I was pleased to see when I came back to the intelligence community um, some mm. years later that there is um, some of that now happening. That if you have a look at the senior people that are in, in um, you know, high office mm. in the intelligence, when the Australian intelligence um, uh, community, um, many of them have had time in other agencies. Mm. Mm. And I would encourage all of our national security uh, officers to branch out in mid-career. Then there's the senior appointments, and by the time you get to those jobs, you need to have read widely, travelled widely, been employed widely, and have developed an understanding of how government works. Mm. Um, governments are peculiar organisations by their very nature. That's the nature of government. And, you know, for a lot of us in the bureaucracy, it's all well and good to say, oh, well, they should be doing this or they should be doing that. But mm. we all know it's the art of the possible. And um, I think if you can, and I've not always been successful at this, but if you're able to understand and support a government to come up with an outcome that is in the national interest, because mm. we're all working towards mm. that. I, I've never worked for a minister or for a government that wasn't working in the national interest. You know, that's always the case. But perceptions of the national interest yeah. might vary, yeah. of course. But so they'd be the kind of things that I would be looking uh, to do. I think it's very important that all officers in the national security, security community have a very good grounding in academic studies, uh, that they're, they're educated and they're experienced and they're travelled. I think, I think they're... Maybe the travel bit is a little bit difficult it's at the moment. It's a bit difficult <laughs> right now. Yeah, it might have to be virtual. You know, it's... Um, and so I think... You mentioned that the the challenge of really being that national security advisor and, and, and herding those cats and really building that new culture that was you said that was one of the great challenges mm. uh, of your career. Uh, could you point us to maybe one or two other very significant moments, whether it's a uh, a point where you had uh, I guess a, a certain kind of self doubt, whether it's a point where you 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 really felt a sense of of achievement, whether individually or collectively. You know, mm. what are some of the big memories that mm. stick with you? Mm. Um, and and incidentally, do you miss um, do you miss having access to the kinds of information you used to? <laughs> I'll answer the last Come one first. Come to that first. later. Yeah. No, <laughs> no? <laughs> no, no, it's a release. <laughs> it's so. a release and a relief. Um, yeah, okay, the, there is a couple of high points. When I was in uniform, obviously as the commanding officer of the SAS regiment, one of the great privileges of mm. my life. And, uh, you know, my heart goes out currently to the, the stresses and strains that that unit is facing, um, a magnificent um, military unit. Um, that's going through some very, very tough times at present and we will see where it goes. Um, the second high point was probably when I was in uniform was when I was the commander up in Timor, the commander of Sector West. Mm. I had essentially a, a brigade size organisation there on the mm. border with uh, mm. Indonesia, with, uh, with West Timor. And it was then that I felt as though all of those years of training, I'd been in the army for, I don't know, mm. 25 years or something at that stage, mm. that it all came together. Mm. Um, and you think, yeah, I've, I've actually learned something along the way and I'm now practicing my art mm. at, at the kind of the pinnacle. So that was, that was wonderful. Mm. And the third experience in uniform that was probably the, well, it was a high point was the formation of the Special Operations Command that was done uh, as the sort of dust was settling in New York and mm. in Washington after 9-11. Uh, we did it in a hurry, uh, and uh, that was a great privilege to have been uh, the, f the first commander of Special Operations Command. Um, subsequently, I've mentioned National Security Advisor. That was, was a high point. Um, I very much enjoyed my time in Brussels. Um, it was something I had not ever expected to mm. do. Uh, it was a surprise. Mm. Um, but I was astonished at how 
much I picked up along the way about diplomacy, even though mm. I, was, I had never been a, a practicing mm. diplomat in that sense. I'd been a military mm. diplomat, mm. I suppose. I'd worked in the embassy in Jakarta as the defence the uh, army attaché, and uh, and so on. So, um, but I, I enjoyed that very much. It's uh, the EU is uh, is mis mus much misunderstood in this country. Mm. Um, and the fact that it still is, as I recall, the largest economy in the world, uh, and it has uh, enormous power and influence and large resources to throw around, albeit not necessarily militarily, mm. but certainly their economic and their technical know-how and so forth is, is very powerful. So that was, that was another high point. Um, I also enjoyed very much when, I mean, I left the army with some trepidation. I thought, you know, am I doing the right thing or not? Uh, every now and again, you have to make one of those leaps of faith. Um, I was asked by Prime Minister Howard if I would come over and mm. run the National Security Division in PM&C. And I remember my wife Jenny and I having a very long conversation about this. I had not long been a general in the army and uh, do you want to leave that, your mm. life calling, and go off and do something else? And uh, I decided that, yes, you're only here once. I should try. I didn't you know, want to die having mm. just been a soldier. I'm very pleased to have that on my headstone, mm. but it's nice to have some other uh, experiences along the way. And uh, I enjoyed PM and C, and I'm very grateful to people like Peter Shergold and Andrew Metcalf and um, officers like that that taught mm. me a great deal about transitioning into the public service. So I, I found it relatively mm. easy, I might say. I'm often asked by, by some, some of your listeners this evening would be um, curious about the transition from yep. a military life to a public service mm. life. I found it um, relatively easy. I mean, the, the things that make people laugh and cry and be happy and be sad. Well, public they're servants all, are human all, after all. They're, they're all the same. <laughs> it, was, it was astonishing to discover this. So, um, no, I, I think um, they'd be the kind of the high points mm. that I can think of over 47 years of, uh, of serving the Crown. And, and it's quite sufficient. That's why I'm pleased not to have access to some of that information. The things you I may, may, things you may have to forget now. And my look, I think my just hair used to be brown, and I, maybe it's going to turn back brown again. Oh, <laughs> I think you've been, you've, you've, you've been looking well this year. So look, just as we finish up, I mean, I think, you know, because there, there are so many, if you like, unsung, unrecognised, uh, I, guess, I guess heroes is a collective word, but, you know, just often just very dedicated uh, national security officials, public mm. servants, uh, people working in all of these agencies of, of government, mm. and often it, it is an area of work where w mm. where you work without public praise, mm. uh, and often I think they encounter challenges as well. That um, mm. you know moments of self doubt and so forth. And I guess any sort of last words of advice, mm. really, mm. Uh, in terms of the kind of culture, uh, mm. the kinds of um, I guess decisions mm. that you'd like to see them make when they reach those mm. those difficult stages? Well, I wish I could uh, show the Australian community at large, those young officers that you speak of, that mm. at three o'clock in the morning are in their office, sitting on their computers, banging out briefings for government or, or whatever. I mean, the work that was d that's was that been done during my lifetime by mm. young officers uh, is just something I take my hat off to them. Um, so I, I think the last thing that I would want to leave viewers and listeners with is that National security has always been important, but it is now, for the foreseeable future, going to be more important and more complicated and require more innovation, uh, require more skill and require harder work than it ever has in the past. So I can't offer you much by way of relief, but I can offer, I think, the prospect of a great challenge going forward. It's a very noble pursuit to be able to contribute to the safety and protection of your community. Um, it is my view that the Australian community understand that, um, but these are going to be very challenging times in the years ahead for national security. Uh, that's a very honest and realistic uh, and sobering mm. note for us to end on, but we are very much at time. Um, Duncan, I want to thank you very much for your time and your thoughts uh, this evening, uh, not only on my, on my own behalf and that of the National Security College, because we do, we do have a debt to you, but also to those who are very interested in this career, this profession and the challenges 
ahead. Uh, normally I'd shake your hand and invite the audience to, um, to offer a round of applause. Uh, so I'll just have to say thank you and just to note as we close that this is the first in a series of conversations on national security to mark the 10th anniversary of the National Security College here at the Australian National University uh, in this COVID safe environment. Uh, Duncan Lewis, thank you very much. And to um, all of you listening, uh, please uh, encourage others to tune in on the ANU TV YouTube channel uh, if they missed the, uh, the live broadcast tonight. Thank you very much, Duncan. Thanks, Rory. Thanks for having me. Good night. Thank you. Good night.